Welcome to our study of the Biblical Covenants, and in this session, we are able to introduce the concept of the covenants as they appear in the Bible. We'll take a look at the importance of the covenants and even jump a little bit into some modern examples of covenants. I'd like to share with you the words that are translated as covenant in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And then we're going to get a little violent at the end and talk about the cutting of a covenant. So welcome aboard. Make sure you have your Bible open to Exodus chapter 19 because we will be studying a couple of verses in that chapter pretty soon. But right now we have some introductory material. One thing that I would encourage you to do would be to be praying for this series and then that you would make a decision that you would be as faithful as possible in viewing each of these lessons so that you could make this theological and biblical journey with me as we go through this study of the biblical covenants together. Maybe invite some friends to watch this video and together we might grow in our understanding of what God has in store for humanity throughout all of its history. So first of all then let's discuss uh, from the scriptures the importance of this covenant concept. In the ancient Near East, that would be in the era of the Old Testament, the nations that were around Israel, they would make covenants. And they made these covenants in the form of oath-binding, solemn vows. They were pledges that were legally binding. And often, you would have one covenant partner pledge to bless another partner, or you would have a covenant partner that would pledge to serve the other partner. Sometimes the pledges made promises that were contingent upon conditions that were being fulfilled. Sometimes the pledge's promise was unconditional. And when we study the covenants in the Bible, we'll be able to see both conditional and unconditional kinds of promises. You're going to learn words like unilateral and lateral and uh, we'll be casting about terms like suzerainty and royal grant and parity when we get down deeper into this whole issue of the covenants. The covenants provide a major unifying feature in all of Scripture, both when it comes to the literature of the Bible and also when it comes to the theology of the Bible. Because the covenants provide this unifying, unfolding theological element and this literary element by establishing, by explaining, and by expressing God's relationships with humanity throughout all of history. And in any time of uncertainty, it's always good to know what is God's plan for the ages. And as we study the biblical covenants together, we are going to learn what does God have in store for humanity? What has He done in the past? What is he doing currently and what will he be doing in the future? So we will be studying these covenants and we have good reason to do so. In the ancient Near East, around the kingdom of Israel, there were Hittites to the north, and you can see that on the slide here in modern day Turkey, there was the Hittite empire. To the south were the Egyptians. To the east, there were the Assyrians and the Babylonians. And in each of these countries, they also made covenants. And the Lord took this common cultural device of a covenant and He used it in a way with His people, His special people Israel. God used the covenant concept to communicate with His people Israel what He had in store for them and what He also had planned for all peoples of the earth. On the map you can see the Hittite Empire and their arche the archaeologists have, un have uncovered a number of, of uh, covenants, for example, that the Hittites have made and that the Egyptians have made and the Assyrians and Babylonians have made. When it comes to the Hittites, they may be uh, best known for these covenants in the ancient Near East. And in the Hittite covenants, for example, just to illustrate what I'm talking about here, the, the Hittite covenants, they had a historical prologue, and sometimes they would have this presentation of the parties to the treaty. They would also have conditions of the treaty, what was expected of the treaty or covenant partners. They would call in witnesses. Usually they would call their false gods into uh, witness that the covenant was being made. And then often the covenants would end with a series of blessings if the covenant stipulations were kept. 
and a series of curses if the covenant stipulations were not kept. So what I'd like for you to do here at the start of this first lesson would be to open your Bibles with me, and we're going to look together in Exodus chapter 19, and I'm going to begin at verse 3 and just illustrate some of these parts of a covenant with you. So find your Bible, open it up to Exodus chapter 19, I'm beginning in verse 3, and I'll work through just a few verses here with you in this chapter. Exodus 19, beginning in verse 3. The Word of God says, Moses went up the mountain to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain. This is what you must say to the house of Jacob and explain to the Israelites. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to me. So already in two verses, verses 3 and 4, we see some of these components of a covenant. God reminds the people of Israel as to who the covenant partners are. This is mentioned in verse 3, because it is with the Israelites that God is making a covenant. So the two treaty partners are God and the nation of Israel. And then in verse 4, we hear a rehearsal of the history that exists between both covenant partners, when the Lord reminds the people of Israel that he had rescued the Israelites from Egyptian bondage. He had carried them on eagle's wings and he had brought them unto himself out there in the wilderness. Now the text continues, this time picking it up in verse 5. Now if you will listen to me and carefully keep my covenant, and there's the word covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the people's although all the earth is mine, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. Now in this verse, in verse 5, we see an example of how there are the expectations of a covenant. What does God expect of the people of Israel? He expects them to listen and to carefully keep his covenant. And then we see the, the promised blessing of this covenant, that if, and that's the condition, so this is a conditional covenant, if they keep his stipulations, then they will be his special people out of all the earth. Even though the Lord owns all the earth, then he makes them his peculiar, his special people, as verse 6 continues, and you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. So in just a handful of verses, you and I can see together how that the Lord takes a culturally common but still very significant way of establishing a relationship. It's called a covenant. He takes that which was used by the other nations that surrounded Israel. He imports it into his way of dealing with the Israelites so that it is something that is common to them. And then the Lord takes that and he invests it with his own teaching and instruction so that the people of Israel will know more about their God and what's very exciting for us in this New Testament age is so that we the people of the church, we are able to also learn more about God and what his plan is for the ages, all right? So the people of Israel had covenants. They had them in their own country. The nations around them practiced this making of covenants. But did you know that in modern times we also have covenants? And if you would just think with me, you probably could come up with some modern examples of covenants and that would help us in many ways to understand the covenants in the Bible. And in this first lesson on the biblical covenants, we're going to work our way through three modern examples of covenants. And the first example, of course, has to do with that example which is certainly closest to home. And it's an example that has transcended time and transcends all cultures, and that is the example of a marriage. Marriage is a specific and solemn pledge between one man and one woman who make vows to each other. The man and the woman are covenant partners. They make a solemn promise to be united as husband and wife for as long as they both will live. And so only death should terminate their covenant of marriage. We live in a broken world. 
and sometimes divorce does take place. But originally, God's plan for marriages was that they would be a lifelong commitment. And in this way, they are a really wonderful example of the power and significance, the solemnity of a covenant relationship. I'm going to read now from the last book of the Old Testament. It's the uh, prophet Malachi. And in chapter 2, Malachi reminds us of the the solemnity and the seriousness of the marriage covenant, how that it should not be entered into lightly, and how that it ought to result in a lifelong, very lasting and enduring relationship between the two covenant partners. That would be between the husband and the wife. I'm reading now from Malachi chapter 2, and I'm reading verses 14, 15, and 16 to illustrate the marriage covenant. This is what the word of the Lord says. Malachi 2, verse 14. Yet you ask, for what reason? So the people of Israel in the days of Malachi, they were, they were faithfully going to the Lord's altar and they were offering their sacrifices and they were doing so regularly. And yet it was evident to them that the Lord was not responding to the offering of their animals. And so, verse 14 says, yet you ask, for what reason? And here comes the answer. Because the Lord has been a witness between you, speaking to a man, and the wife of your youth. You, man, you, husband, you, groom, have acted treacherously against her. That would be against your wife, against your bride, though she was your marriage partner. So she's a partner because of the covenantal relationship that was established between the husband and wife when they shared their solemn vows as were witnessed by others around them. Again, the text continues, you have acted treacherously against her though she was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. Verse 15, didn't the one God make us with the remnant of his life breath? And what does the one, that is what does the one God seek? A godly offspring. So watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously against the wife of your youth. You see, it's famously said in the prophecy of Malachi that God does hate divorce. It's not that he hates divorced people, but God hates what divorce does to people and especially to children. Notice what it said in the verses that I read, how that the Lord is concerned for the godly offspring and God wants for marriages to endure. He wants for them to persist and they should because God has intended for marriage to be a lifelong commitment. I think of the next book in our Bibles, that would be the first book of the New Testament and in Matthew chapter 19, our Savior had something to say about the enduring nature of the marriage covenant, how that it is not an arrangement to be entered into lightly because the marriage covenant is solemnified with its pledges, that is with its vows, and it has its stipulations, doesn't it? There are expectations that are placed upon a marriage relationship, that being of mutual support, exclusivity of relationship, steadfastness and, uh, of love and that sacrificial love. And even in the best and in the worst of times, it is to persist. And also, of course, there is the expectation of sexual union. Now, what does it say here in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 6? Again, the words of our Savior. This is what he says. Haven't you read, he replied, that he, that is God, that he who created them, that is God created Adam and Eve, in the beginning, way back in the book of Genesis, back in chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis, that God made them male and female. And he also said, so this is what God said when he created Adam and Eve, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So that was God's original plan. So they are no longer two, Jesus continues after making that Old Testament quotation, but one flesh, one entity. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. So these verses remind us of a modern example of a covenant. It's something that we can understand how that two partners, the husband and the wife in this case, they make a very 
formal and lasting agreement and arrangement that is predicated upon vows that are spoken in good faith the one to the other. Now think with me. That's a well-known example of a modern covenant. Can you think of any other examples of covenants? Can you? How about the example of real estate property? You see, we in modern times, we have real estate covenants. Some of them are restrictive and some of them open up the use of a piece of real estate. It is a solemn contractual promise written into the deed of real property that runs with the land. So if a, a uh, covenant that is tied to real estate is formally arranged and then that property is sold, did you know that that covenant persists even after the sale? It is a perpetual arrangement that binds all future owners of the property to the stipulations of the covenant. It's very difficult to get rid of, of a uh, real estate covenant. They have to do with easement, they have to do with restrictions of use, so, for example, you might purchase a piece of farm property from a neighbor and the neighbor wants to be able to get his tractor across that property to another field. So he might sell you that field with the stipulation that he has the right in such and such weeks of the year, both in, in planting and in harvest, to drive his tractor or his combine across property that he no longer owns. But he writes that into the sale of the property. So it's written right into the deed of that real estate. That's another example you see of how binding and how formal a covenant is. And we experience this kind of a covenant in our everyday lives when it comes to real estate and property like that. Now think with me. Think again. Can you think of a third modern example of a covenant in modern times? Think with me. Here's a third example. The third example is the example of the last will and testament. A last will and testament is a formal and legally binding declaration of benefits. So it declares some benefits or some blessings. It makes some promises. And sometimes that last will and testament will even have some stipulations or expectations because let's say grandma and grandpa write their last will and testament, they may say, we will gift such and such to so and so with the understanding that so and so is still following after Jesus and is a faithful servant of his. We know that last wills and testaments will actually sometimes carry these kinds of stipulations. It could also be that the stipulation is all of my grandchildren would be able to enter into each one having an equal portion of this and that property. Well, what's the stipulation there? The stipulation is that you must be a descendant, a grandchild of the testator. So the last will and testament is a legal disposition that is one-sided. It is made unilaterally and it is written and ratified before its stipulations are actually enacted. And when would those stipulations be enacted or followed through upon? They would take place, as you know, upon the death of the testator. So the fulfillment of the pledge, the, the promises that are made in the last will and testament are contingent upon a condition. And that condition is that the, the person who makes the promises now has passed away, has passed on to glory, we hope. So there is this understanding now, we're using words like condition and stipulation, expectation, promises, vows, the formality, the solemnity of it. And with these three kinds of modern covenants, you have a better understanding of what a covenant actually is. And it will help you then to understand the covenants that exist in the Bible. Now I want you to think with me, we have taken a look at the marriage covenant, real estate covenants, uh, last will and testament covenants, and can you think of any other kinds of modern day covenants? There actually are some, and you'll see here I have provided for you my ministry email, and if you would like to email me your guests, I'll be happy to entertain your guests as to what might be some other examples of modern covenants. You can just email me there at uh, that address that you can see there. All right, we're going to move right on ahead now, and we're going to talk about the two words in 
the Bible that are translated into our English Bibles as the word covenant. So as you know, in the Old Testament, there, there are Hebrew words, and in the New Testament, there are Greek words. So in the Old Testament, what is the word for covenant? And the word for covenant happens to be the word berit, B-E-R-I-T, berit. You can say it with me if you'd like. You ready to say it now? You're going to learn your, your first Hebrew word. So you're going to get a head start in heaven because this is the language of the king. Are you ready? One, two, three. Berit. Good. Berit. And we think that the word berit, it's a noun for covenant, actually is based upon the verb for bara. And bara means to create and maybe even to fashion by cutting. All right. So an example would be to pair a reed or a stick and with a knife to, to uh, keep cutting away at the reed or the stick to fashion it into a writing utensil, almost like a pen or a quill, like a stylus, okay? So you can understand that a covenant or a berit has embedded in it this concept of cutting, and I hope to say more about that in the moments to follow. So the Hebrew word for covenant is the word berit, and it's tied to this concept of cutting. And now I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the Greek word for a covenant. And to understand this, you need to realize that in the Greco-Roman world, the usual word for a contract was the word suntheke. That was the usual word for a contract. But in the New Testament scriptures, there's actually a different word that is used for a covenant, and it's the word diatheke. Dia Theke, diatheke. Maybe you'd like to say your first Greek word with me, so I'll give you the countdown, one, two, three, and you'll say diatheke with me. Just think now, by following through on lesson one, you not only get to jump into the scriptures a little bit, but you even get to learn a little bit of Hebrew and Greek. So we're going to say diatheke together, one, two, three, diatheke. So the word diatheke, translated as covenant in our English New Testament, is is coming to us really because in the Old Testament, which was first written in Hebrew, was later translated into Greek. And when the, when the people who translated the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek came across that old Hebrew word of berit, if you haven't forgotten, berit, they would translate the Hebrew word berit with the Greek word diatheke. They didn't use the regular Greek word for a contract, which was suntheke. Instead, they used the special word, the special Greek word, diatheke. And they used it because the word diatheke conveys the idea of a legally binding declaration of benefits. Okay? So just like the Hebrew word berit carries with it this concept of cutting, the New Testament word of diatheke carries with it this concept of a declaration of benefits. All right? So a covenant may have characteristics in common with an everyday contract or some regular old agreement, but the essence of a covenant when it comes to this Greek word of diatheke carries with it this legally binding pledge that makes a set of promises or a declaration of benefits. So now you have a better understanding of the two words for a covenant in our scriptures. We might summarize this by saying that a covenant in the Bible is far more than just a contract. A contract is something that might be broken easily, can end up in court and adjudicated, but a covenant is far more serious. It's better illustrated by a marriage, by uh, a, a restrictive real estate uh, covenant, and also by a last will and testament. And this is conveyed also, and it helps with our understanding when we learn the Hebrew word and the Greek word, berit and diatheke. Now, in our final major point in lesson number one, we're going to talk about this concept of cutting or the making of a covenant. Repeatedly throughout the Old Testament, people make covenants with one another and God makes covenants with people or with the nation of Israel. And behind that English word make, when it's used in the context of making a covenant, there's a, there's a word that isn't really the word for make at all. 
Instead, it's the word for cut. So in the Old Testament, the technical phrase to make a covenant is actually the translation of a phrase to cut a covenant. And the Hebrew for karat, to cut a covenant, it occurs throughout the Old Testament Whenever you see the phrase making of a covenant, it would be the cutting of a covenant. So I'm going to jump ahead here, and although the slide says Genesis 15, 18, I'm going to start actually with uh, the Jeremiah verse, and I have a reason to do that. So I'm jumping now to Jeremiah chapter 31, and in verse 33, so find your place in your Bible, Jeremiah 31, 33, and this is what the word of the Lord says, Jeremiah 31, 33. This chapter always excites me. It warms my heart. We'll get there eventually, but this is the announcement of a new covenant that God will make with the, with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So here we are in Jeremiah 31, 33. I hope you have your place here. I'll read it out loud. You can follow along silently as I read. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Now you may have heard that phrase there in the beginning of verse 33. Did you hear it? I will make. So this covenant that God will make with the house of Israel in those latter days. The Hebrew word behind the word for make is the word to cut. And just as an aside here, you may have heard those phrases at the end of the verse where the blessing, the promise of this new covenant is that God would be the God of Israel and they would be his people. That is reminiscent, isn't it? Of one of the blessings of that covenant that we first studied in this first lesson back in Exodus chapter 19, where if the people kept God's law, they would be his people. Do you remember that? Now in the new covenant, God actually promises that he will write his law on their hearts and they will keep his law and they will be his people. So you see a contrast there. The covenant in Exodus 19 is conditional, right? Whereas the covenant here in Jeremiah 31 is unconditional. All right, so the cutting this concept of the cutting of a covenant, the making of a covenant really being the cutting of a covenant, hearken back to the slaughter of the ritual sacrifice that accompanied the ratification of the covenant. And so now you may turn with me back to Genesis and you'll realize why I wanted to go with Jeremiah first. And now we're going to go to Genesis and back to chapter 15. This is one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. This is the chapter that describes the covenant that God makes with Abraham, the covenant that he then reconfirms with Abraham and with Abraham's son. Who's his son? Isaac. And then he reconfirms it even again with Abraham's grandson. And who is Abraham's grandson? Jacob. So this is the covenant that God makes with Abraham through the line of Isaac and Jacob. And when you jump with me back here to the first book of the Bible, chapter 15 of Genesis, and we look together at verses 17 and 18, you will see with me how that there is this cutting of the animals. Okay, so now I'm in Genesis chapter 15, and I'm looking at verses 17 and 18. When the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, I give this land to your offspring. So you see there's a blessing in that covenant. In the Abrahamic covenant, one of the blessings has to do with land. Oh, don't worry, we'll learn in the coming lessons that there are plenty of other blessings associated with the Abrahamic covenant. But here in this text, we see the reference to the land of promise. You also heard with me, didn't you, when God says that he would make a covenant with Abram? It says, on that day the Lord, I should say, made a covenant with Abram. Do you remember the word behind the word for made? That's right, it's the word he cut. God cut the Lord cut a covenant with Abram. And then in verse 17, we see evidence of that cutting because there's this reference to the divided animals. 
Abram earlier in chapter 15 had been commanded to take a set of animals and to divide them, to cut them in halves. Okay? Sometimes in the ancient Near East, in those countries that surrounded the peoples of Israel, the covenant parties would eat parts of the animal, and then also parts of the animal would be burned in sacrifice to their false gods. Sometimes the covenant parties would walk between the halves of the animals that had been cut in two, and they did that in order to solemnize their covenant pledge or pledges to one another, signifying their determination to keep the stipulations of the covenant, to follow through on the promises of the covenant on pain of death. So you can imagine with me that the covenant partners would take each other by the hand and they would walk together between the parts of the animals. That would be very serious. That would be a very graphic way to remind the covenant partners, if I don't keep this solemn promise, then may the the false gods in that case, may the gods do to me just like I have done to these animals. I would deserve to be ripped apart if I don't keep these promises. So now in this instance here in Genesis 15, one of the reasons why I love this chapter is because God takes this common way of establishing a lasting binding relationship that was used in the ancient Near East called a covenant, and then now God infuses it with his own teaching and communicates some profound truths to the nation of Israel, to Abraham, of course, and to his descendants through Isaac and Jacob. And God is communicating to the people of Israel that he is making a set of promises that he alone is obligating himself to keep. Abram doesn't go through the parts of the animals with God. No, instead God, in a visible manifestation as this uh, flaming torch in this this smoking fire pot, God alone works his way through those parts of the animal. And God is saying that he himself has obligated himself to keep these promises to Abram through the descendants of Isaac and Jacob. That's very exciting. And we'll be able to study this covenant in greater detail in the lessons to come. So as we wrap up this first lesson together, regardless of the specific rituals that were used that were performed in connection with the sacrifice or the shedding of the blood of those animals. One final point here, and that is that the shedding of blood was often central to the rituals by which a covenant was formally cut or made, that is, when it was formally ratified. And the shedding of blood communicated the solemn seriousness of the covenant and its stipulations. So I would like to review with you now. Just remember this evening we've taken a look at the importance of this covenant concept, how that the covenants bind together both testaments, that they run as themes throughout both testaments, how that they teach us what God has in store, not only for the nation of Israel, but for all of humanity throughout all of history. I've shared with you three modern examples of covenants, marriage, real estate covenants, and the last will and testament concept. I have taught you a Hebrew word and a Greek word that are translated as covenant in both Old Testament and New Testament. And you can start practicing the words berit and diatheke with your friends. And then I also initiated you into this idea of the cutting of a covenant and how that it made a ratification ceremony very serious and obligated the treaty partners with, with solemnity to follow through on their pledges and to be obedient to the stipulations and to the expectations. Let's pray with one another in the coming days that we will be faithful to the Lord, follow closely after Jesus. We'll invite some friends to watch the next uh, lesson uh, uh, in, the, in, in the comfort of their home where they might be able to grow in their understanding of the Word of God and that we might rejoice in Christ our Savior who died and rose again to provide us his free gift of eternal life to everyone who will simply believe in him. In the next lesson, lesson number two, we will be studying the ratification of covenants, the signs of covenants, and the three different kinds of covenants. We'll embark on that journey together as we take a look at parity, suzerainty, and royal grant treaties, and then settle in on a nice study of parity treaties together. May the Lord bless you as he has blessed me, as I've been able to study these scriptures together. May you find 
the working of the Holy Spirit as you take his word, open it up, and we discover together these great teachings on the covenants of the Bible.